All right, as promised, here comes your lecture on natural gas. Now you might notice that there is no camera picture of me talking, and that's because I don't want to scare you guys. It is Sunday afternoon, and um, I'm being nice and lazy. I'm hanging out in my pajamas, making some recordings for you. So not looking real professional, hence I'm not running the camera. don't want to scare you. Anyway, um, as I said, this, this lecture is on natural gas, which is our third and final fossil fuel that we're going to talk about um, in our series of non-renewable energy sources. So natural gas is primarily used for electricity, um, heating homes, automobile fuels. There's not a lot of cars here in the United States that use natural gas, but they're becoming more and more. And then also some industries uh, use natural gas, so in commercial um, industries as well. Now, natural gas is definitely the most refined fossil fuel, which basically means it contains the least amount of carbon. So it actually burns quite a bit cleaner than both coal and oil or gasoline. Um, it comes out of the ground already refined because it's basically a result of cooking coal and oil in the ground from the temperature um, the heat from the Earth's core coming up. So it's cooking it already, and then you get these pockets of gas, and then we tap into those and pull them out. So we don't have to undergo any refining process once we're heat, once we extract it. The only thing that we have to do is compress it, and that can take quite a bit of energy. We have to compress it down into a liquid from a gas into a liquid so that we can transport it. It does burn 50% cleaner than coal. And it burns quite a bit cleaner than gasoline. You can see the statistics there on the slide. 70% less carbon monoxide release than compared with gasoline. 87% less um, nitrous oxides. And 20% less carbon dioxide. So overall, much better in terms of what's being released into the air for air pollution. Now, there is the issue that at our current consumption rate, we estimate there's maybe a 60-year world supply. So it's definitely not, you know, the new answer, like let's just all switch to natural gas and go because we have most of that fossil fuel infrastructure there. That's not going to be the solution because we're only going to have it for 60 years and we're going to run out. What are we going to do then? Uh, the primary component of natural gas is methane, which is CH4, and that's that real stinky stuff that, you know, comes out of the rear end of cows. Um, it is a, uh, excuse me, a greenhouse gas, a very potent greenhouse gas. It can take in a lot of heat, but um, you also can burn it, and it gives off a lot of heat, and that's why it's very useful. Well, so how do we get natural gas? Well, there's a couple different methods. There's... Um, coal bed methane which is one type of natural gas and that comes from these coal reserves they basically contain methane that can be extracted and they drill a well down and then I'm not I don't fully understand this process it's actually not the most popular one these days but they basically suck the water out of this coal deposit and then somehow that allows the methane gas to re be released and it bubbles up through the water and then you know the, they take out the water out one way and then they take the methane out and send it the other way where they'll compress it and then send it along the line where it can be used. Um, you'll see some links there so when you look at the PowerPoint um, on your own make sure to check those out. Um, and one of the issues here you can see the picture on the left there with all the little blank spots and all these roads is wildlife habitat. Um, a lot of times, you know, they have to drill these wells all over the place. You're often interfering with migration corridors. You're interfering with habitat. Um, you've got trucks driving in and out, disturbing wildlife in general. So you definitely have a large impact. You can see some pronghorn down there on the lower left that are trying to squeeze under a fence that's probably been put around a property where they inserted or put in a whole bunch of methane wells because they wanted to extract it but these pronghorn need to get across because that's their migration corridor so you know as with anything there's pros and cons now um, one of the more popular places that you hear about natural gas is the marcellus shale you see kind of that gray band that sort of makes almost a number five shape and it starts up um, you know, kind of in the northeast there and then swings down through into um, Illinois. It sort of ends in Illinois there, so from like Pennsylvania to Illinois. Now, um, it's estimated there's enough natural gas contained just within the Marcellus Shale to supply the U.S. for 14 years. There's a big problem with it, though, and that is that it's very difficult to access, and you have to use a special process, which is one you're hearing about quite frequently in the media these days, and that's called hydrofracking. 
Um, it's short for hydraulic fracturing. And it's a very intensive process. And until recently, it's actually been under major wraps like super secret, all the stuff that goes on. But I want to give you kind of an overview of how it works. So the idea is that they have this natural gas locked up in this in these rocks. And in order to get the natural gas out, what they have to do is they drill a super deep well. You can see in this picture off to the right here that the well goes down about 6,000 feet into the ground. So they're digging these long, really narrow wells. And then once they get down to about 16 feet, then they send the well in a parallel direction. So it comes down, makes a 90 degree turn, and goes out. And so you're down in this layer of shale. And then once they have drilled all of this, and of course, meanwhile, they've gone past, you can see in the blown up picture at the very top there, that blue line, um, just a few feet from the surface, you know, that's the aquifer. So if you were drilling into our valley here, these wells are going down through the aquifers. And so you're probably going to have some kind of impact on the groundwater. And indeed, we do see some major consequences with groundwater contamination from hydrofracking. But back to how this works, so they drill this really long well. Then what they do is they use this special slurry of fluid. And until recently, and as far as I know, they are still allowed to keep quite a bit of it under wraps, these hydraulic fracturing companies did not have to release what chemicals were in this fluid. They would just go in and they are sending it down the well. And what they're doing is it's this fluid that um, they use and it's got little particles of sand and so they send this fluid in and they basically you know at extreme high pressure they shove it in there and these little particles of sand that were within this fluid are causing they they send off these little detonations at the bottom you see to create these cracks and then the little sand particles go in there and they hold these cracks open then they suck all that fluid out with all these potentially cancer causing chemicals and what do they do with it well they dispose of it in these open pits, these containment basins. Some of them are lined, some of them aren't always lined. And this is where we're seeing a lot of ground, supposed groundwater contamination. We can't say for sure, um, but they're just having these pits of water there. And then once these cracks are held open with these little pieces of sand, then they start being able to extract the natural gas. So you can see that it's a very intensive process and it requires a lot of chemicals. And there are all kinds of stories about issues that have been happening, especially along the Marcellus Shale, where the number of hydrofracking wells going in is ridiculous. I mean, um, companies are going in and paying immense amounts of money to people who own land saying, you know, we want to drill for natural gas here. We think that we can get gas out of here. And so they're paying these people and these people are allowing them to come in. And then we're having consequences of livestock dying or getting really sick, losing their hair from drinking contaminated water. People are contracting cancer. Um, there's cases of people's, um, when they turn the tap on in their house, you can smell the natural gas and some people can actually light their water on fire. There's so much natural gas seeping into their groundwater supply. So problems with hydrofracking, polluted groundwater after hydrofracking. Of course, the gas companies who are in there in, in taking out the natural gas and putting in the hydrofracking are saying, it's not our fault. We are, you know, there's, we're not contaminating the water. The water is totally okay to drink. And this is what they're telling people. But then when the people go to their house, they get a glass of water and they take it over and they say, it's okay to drink, then you drink it. They won't drink it. But, you know, meanwhile, they can light their taps on fire. People are getting sick, like I said, contracting cancer at high rates. A lot of their livestock is drinking this contaminated water. There's um, incidences of horses like getting really sick, totally losing all their hair, losing massive amounts of weight. A lot of them are dying. So um, there's some major issues. In one example, I heard a story about a gentleman who went outside in the summer to get the slip and slide out for his kids. It was hot. They just wanted to run around in the yard. He got the slip and slide out, he laid it out, he went to turn the hose on, and when he turned on the hose, there had been so much natural gas that had built up in that hose that the second it hit the air and the sun and went through the metal at the end of the hose, somehow the entire hose basically exploded in his face. Um, I 
do not believe he survived, but I'm not 100% sure about that, so don't quote me on that. But these are causes, these are incidences of what's happening. Now, I put a link up there, a video to learn about some of the problems with hydrofracking. You'll also see down there in red, if you're interested in another extra credit opportunity, I'm offering extra credit for any students interested in watching a documentary on hydrofracking, specifically in the Marcell Marcellus Shale. It's called Gasland. And um, you can get it through Netflix. You can write up a one and a half page summary on what you learned and how it relates to class and submit that for extra credit. Um, again, that's called Gasland. You might be able to find it through whatever internet video sources you guys use, but um, I have Netflix. I know it's available that way. So basically, um, you know, that's kind of the gist of it. You extract natural gas in pockets where you're already finding coal and oil. Um, it doesn't occur on its own. It's basically a byproduct of cooking that coal and oil in the ground. Um, the pros of using natural gas, it has a lot of uses. Again, the primary source um, is used to make electricity. We also use it for heating, heating our homes, for industry, commercial, and um, some places automotive. I mean, Sunline Bus has buses that run on natural gas. There are other cars out there that do run on natural gas. Um, the problem with having cars running on it is that there's not a major amount of infrastructure available for it. So you have to find places that have natural gas at the pump. It's not always easy to find. It is the most refined of all the fossil fuels. It contains the least amount of carbon. It burns cleaner than both coal and oil, 50% cleaner than coal. And the statistics for gasoline are there, again, to repeat for you. And um, some of the cons, again, there's only about 60 year world supply. So it's not gonna last all that long in the overall picture. As I just mentioned, there's a really big lack of infrastructure. It's difficult to transport because it's in a gaseous state. So you have to put it under immense pressure and cool it down a lot in order to transport it in a liquefied state. And that uses a lot of energy. There's a lot of environmental damage and health risks, especially with that hydrofracking. So watch Gasland, it'll be a real eye opener for you. And um, the, the, it's very dangerous to extract that coal bed methane underground. Um, there even are incidences in coal mines, you know, when they used to send guys down there instead of having the long wall miner that they, uh, excuse me, the long wall unit that they have now. When people used to be down there, that was one of the reasons they would carry um, canaries down there was not only for the carbon monoxide, but the methane. Now you can smell the methane right away, but it's extremely explosive. So it would be leaching out of the coal and all of a sudden the smallest little thing would ignite it and it would just explode and you have these massive explosions. So it can be very dangerous as well. All right, um, I think on our next lecture, we're gonna start summing up what we've gone over and um, shortly be finishing up.